this morning on Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, I'd like to share a few myths you may hear from our secular and godless world about the topic of abortion and the child in the womb. <clears throat> Myth number one. The fetus is just a clump of cells that's part of the mother's body. That is false. An unborn child has its own genetic code from day one. That is from conception. And even scientists can't argue this since they themselves define an unborn child as a distinct organism. Myth number two. The use of contraception decreases the abortion rate. Survey says that that is false too. Contraception induces a rise of promiscuity, leading to a rise in sexual relations and unintended pregnancies, leading to an increase in abortion rates. Myth number three. Planned Parenthood often provides prenatal care and adoptive adoption referrals and only some abortions. That again is a big fat lie. 97% of pregnant clients at Planned Parenthood get abortions. And every day they make over $583,000 off those abortions. That's a day. It's over half a million dollars a day. So what we see from these facts, they are slaughtering children, sacrificing them on the altar of Moloch in the name of lust, convenience, and greed. This is truly a heartbreaking church. So please turn your Bibles to the Psalms. We're going to be conducting our study in Psalm 139 and focusing on verses 13 through 16. And our message this morning is called, We Knit We Be Together. As you're finding your place in God's Word, I want to share that we'll be focusing on God's design of us, on how all life is absolutely precious, for it is God who forms us, wonderfully making us into His image. And on top of that, He writes out all the days of our life. And before we consider the text, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, please help us so that the focus here is on your truth, on your word. And Lord, we know that there is so much opposition to the truth that's found in your word. Lord, but give us the courage to boldly proclaim it. As many of our brothers and sisters today are also dedicating this message to focus on the life that you've given us and creating us in your image. Lord, give them the boldness to speak your truth boldly. And may your body be equipped and empowered to go out into this world to speak and share with them the truth of your word. And may we be the light to this dark world, a mirror reflecting your light to a world that desperately needs it. Lord, guide all our teachings and everything, Lord, so that it is all filtered through your word. And we praise all in your precious son's name, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, church, our passage today is Psalm 139, verse 13 to 16. And that passage reads, For you form my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. And I would be made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me. But as yet, there was none of them. So let's take a look at our first point. God formed us. Again, I want to reiterate what it says in verse 13. For you formed my inward parts, you knit me together in my mother's womb. So the term inward parts, which is kiliah in the Hebrew, 
was used to refer to organs like the kidney. Additionally, like it is used here, it was used as a metaphor of one's inner self and often used in parallel with the heart. That is because the kidney was considered the seat of human emotions or moral character in the ancient world. That fact that God intricately put us together is completely mind-blowing, especially when you consider all of creation. When you have time, if you have never seen it visually, I recommend that you do, look at the size of the whole entire earth in comparison to a single human being. Now let me help you get a mental image of that. The earth is about 3.5 million times larger than a human being. Then look at the size of the earth in comparison to the size of the sun. The sun's volume would need 1.3 million earths to fill it. Then after visualizing that, look at the sun in comparison to the whole entire solar system. It's pretty amazing, right? Well then look at the solar system in comparison to our galaxy, which is called the Milky Way. This Milky Way galaxy, in comparison to our solar system, is 160 million times larger. And comprehend this if you will. But our galaxy is only one of an estimated 200 billion in the whole entire universe. Beloved, God's creation is absolutely incredible and absolutely mind-blowing. And as technology keeps on in, uh, improving and telescopes keep seeing further and further, do not be surprised if we learn that God's creation is bigger still. And that is not even taking into consideration the spiritual world that we can't see with our human eyes. So in that context, I want you to see what it says in Psalm 8, verses 3 through 8. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and all the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. So despite this vast creation, God cares so much for every single human life. He personally puts us together. Knitting us together as a piece of fine art with the most intricate of details. If you've ever just seen the eye and seen how intricate it is, it will blow your mind away. As Isaiah 64, 8 says, But now, Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. So, as a skillful potter patiently and skillfully crafts his masterpiece. So too our God crafts human life in each mother's womb. In comparison to all of creation, we are nearly unnoticeable. A microscopic speck of dust in a vast, endless ocean. Yet he loves us still being mindful of us, stitching together our organs together, composing our complex DNA codes, establishing our unique personalities and gifts, and then putting his signature on every single one of us with our one-of-a-kind fingerprints. We are truly fearfully and wonderfully made. And this takes us to our next point. Verses 14 
to the first half of 16 says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depth of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. The phrase, fearfully, that's said here in our passage, it can be better understood and better rendered as remarkably. So the verse says, in other words, I am remarkably and wonderfully made. And the word frame here, in ancient Hebrew, refers to one's bones. So as the Faith Life Study Bible notes, people in the ancient Near East considered bones to be particularly indicative of a person's nature because they were the deepest and longest lasting parts of the person. And the words that we see in our passage that says secret and depth of the earth are used figuratively as a metaphor for a mother's womb. The phrase unformed substance is referring to an embryo. So we see that this passage reveals that God is sovereign over all events and instances to the point that he is active even as a child is growing and developing in a mother's womb. That's how sovereign our God is. We as humans are unique in God's creation. We are set apart from everything else, for we are created in the image of God. Genesis 1, verses 26 to 28 puts it this way. And then God said, Let us make man in our own image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. The image of man, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. From the very beginning, God created us in his very own image. And he gave us authority to have dominion over the rest of the earth, calling us to be good stewards of his creation. And as much as our current society hates it, God's word, along with science for that matter, make it undebatable that God created humans only as male and female. I don't care what society says. I don't care what some states say. Doesn't matter what the federal government says, what some schools say, God created them male and female. And marriage is God ordained, and it always has been, always is, and will always be between one man and one woman. To suggest otherwise is to claim that God made a mistake, but God doesn't do that, He is perfect. And as we have seen, he is completely sovereign in how he puts us together, putting together our DNA code and forming our organs and doing all these things. To say that he did a mistake is contrary to who God is. God is completely sovereign. As created beings in the image of God, we also are instructed from the very beginning Never to take the life, never to take another life with our own hands. Genesis 9, verse 6 says, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. So outside of war or capital punishment, as even in this verse we see it, we never are to shed the blood of another person. Again, As much as our current society hates it, the Word of God is absolutely crystal clear on this point. We are never to take the life of someone. That is, regardless of the fact of whether they are outside the womb or inside the womb. 
Murder is murder regardless of the location of the victim. Shedding blood is still shedding blood no matter the size of the victim. Again, let me be clear. It does not matter to me whether YouTube takes this down or censors this message. It does not matter. You cannot stop the biblical truth that's founded in Scripture. Even if society decides that for believers it's time to put them in orange jumpsuits, let them. We are not to run away from this. We are to stand on God's truth. Because we as believers, we don't care what society says. We don't care what some states say. We don't care what the federal government has to say about the matter. We don't care about what some schools say. No one has the right to abort a baby. For human life is precious to our God, the one and only God of all creation. As Luke 12, 7 says, Why even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are more but you are of more value than many sparrows. This is our God, who counts the hairs in your head. And mind you, that number changes. And he still keeps track of it. That's our God. Now for those who are hearing this message, and in your past you may have ended up making a very horrible mistake, Maybe your sins of your past that are haunting you know this. There is always hope in Christ. No sin is too great except the sin of altogether rejecting him until the very end. But as long as there is breath in your lungs, there is still hope. Remember who wrote a major part of the New Testament the chief of sinners, Paul. Because it was God who took the chief of sinner and shattered his stone heart and turned it into flesh. It's never too late. If this is you, ashamed of your past sin, cry out to him. Repent of your sins. All your sins repent of it. Turn away from it completely. And surrender to the only name that saves, Jesus Christ. For as believers, he has an even greater love and calling for us. We can't forget the fact that he created us to be his personal workmen. Even though he could do it all, he still chooses to use us. Look at the profound truth found in Ephesians 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is our great purpose. God didn't create his elect just to sit around and do nothing. He called us to be active. He created us to be his workmen. That's why when you're saved, you're not just beamed up into heaven. You're still left here. And the amazing thing is that all of this was prepared before the foundations of the world were even laid down. Meaning that this has always been God's plan from the beginning. So we are called by Christ to serve him. We must walk in his ways. We can't forget what Christ has done for us. We can't forget Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 5, that says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. We must thank God for our salvation. He is the absolute author of salvation. For he is the one who wrote out every one of our days. 
And this takes us to our next and final point. Every day is already written. The second half of verse 16 says this, In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. This, mer this verse makes it very clear that God sovereignly ordains one's life before they are even ever conceived. This truth follows the pattern that we see all throughout Scripture. For example, one only has to look at Jeremiah 1 verse 5 to see this truth reiterated, which says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. So before Jeremiah was even in the womb, that, that's before conception, God knew him and already wrote out the days of his life, which included God's perfect plan that he would be a prophet of his. That's how sovereign our God is. Isaiah has very similar words to share in Isaiah 49, verse 5, which he says, And now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. Again, the narrative is the same over and over and over again. God is the one who plans our days. God plans every day and every detail of our days. Just look at what it says in Psalm 56, 8. You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Every event God has written out in our book of life, even recording every tear that we shed, he has written it all out. Not a single thing do you experience in your life for nothing. It all has a perfect purpose. God's plan accounts for everything. Meaning, God even plans whom will be set apart for salvation, as it says in Galatians 1 verse 15. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace. Believers are only saved by the mercy and grace of God. Scripture has taken away anything that we can say that points to something that we did or would do. It is not by our own merits, by the things that we would do, that we are saved. No, it is by grace. We are saved. So we can only be humble and thank God with all our heart that he has shown mercy amongst us. And with that thankfulness, go out to others and share with them the good news of Christ. So in our prayers, let us not forget who is the one who rules over all. And let us not forget the one who can that we are to make all our appeals to, for he is the sovereign king. When we seek protection from those who persecute us, let us remember the words of Psalm 31, verse 15, which says, My times are in your hand. Rescue from the hand of my enemies. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. And we when we seek to better know his word, let us put this verse into our memory, this truth that's found in Psalm 119 verse 73, your hands have made and fashioned me give me understanding that I may learn your commandments and finally, let us never lose heart for if we are followers of Christ, then the plans of God the ones that he has for us, they always lead to good, as it says in Romans 8 verse 28 and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Our passage that we have looked at in Psalm 139 is a very powerful message. And the truth found in it simply flies in the face of the morals 
of this generation, especially on the topic of the sanctity of life. I want you to consider this note from the ESV Study Bible. Based on the consistent testimony of Scripture, the early Jewish and Christian tradition, and what can be known of God's moral law through natural revelation, the unborn child should be protected as a person from the moment of conception. A strong argument can in fact be made for this even apart from biblical revelation. For the only difference between babies in utero and babies that are and babies that are born are number one, their location, number two, their size, number three, their level of develop of dependence, and number four, their level of development. But these are not morally relevant factors that would allow death for one set of babies, the preborn, and the life of the other, those who have been born. What then of the hard cases concerning pregnancy resulting from rape or incest? Christians should give compassionate care to those affected by such sins, including both the mother and the unborn child. But if it is wrong to put such a child to death after it is born, and surely this is wrong, then surely it is wrong to put the same child to death before it is born. The preborn baby should be treated as a person in the image of God. For this reason, embryonic stem cell research, which involves the creation of human embryos in order to harvest their stem cells for medical uses, should be viewed as the in intentional creation and destruction of distinct individual tiny human lives. Other sources of stem cells should be used instead where the removal of the cells does not harm a human being. The witness of scripture as confirmed by the testimony of the early church is that every human being from conception through natural death is to be respected as a person created in the image of God whose life has special dignity by virtue of his or her relationship to the creator. Like the early church, Christians should be known as the people who protect, nurture, and cherish children as gifts from the Lord. So as this message comes to a close, I want to share this about a ministry that I currently serve as a board member of. That ministry, as many of you know, is CareNet of Penny Ann. CareNet of Penny Ann is a Christian Pregnancy and Family Resource Center. In fact, Gail is the executive director of Penny Ann. That's actually why she's not here. She's going to other churches speaking about this very subject. So please keep her in your prayers. For although all board members, volunteers, and staff are believers, we will serve whoever comes to our doors. CareNet comes along those facing an unplanned pregnancy, and we present them with the absolute truth of the options available to them with the goal to empower them to make life-affirming choices, for them to choose life. Additionally, CareNet provides many resources such as pregnancy tests, referrals for limited ultrasounds, parenting education classes, material aid, life skill lessons, and Christian discipleship programs. Many members of our community well, live well below the poverty line. So we help to bridge the gap for necessary baby care items. Sorry. So we help bridge the gap for necessary baby care items, such as diapers, wipes, clothing, bath items, bottles, formula, and so much more. One of our clients recently uh, receiving material aid shared this. I started going to CareNet when I was pregnant with my son. Karina has helped me so much with getting a car seat and tons of baby supplies. Without the help from the videos and all the learning I have received through the first six months, I wouldn't have been able to do it without them. They are so friendly and helpful. I would recommend their program to anyone I know that could use the help. I'll be going to visit them as much as I can. Living out the commands of Scripture to be God's workman, to love others, and to provide for the needy in our community is an incredible honor and blessing to all in the ministry. 
our number one goal still remains the same, to reach abortion-minded and abortion-leaning women, edu educate them to make life affirming uh, make a life-affirming decision and to hear the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, church, this year was full of monumental victories and heartbreaking attacks. We have seen the work of 50 years come to fruition in the overturning of Roe, something many thought would, we would never see in our lifetime. However, our work does not stop there. We must continue to press on and we must continue to run the race with endurance. We must continue to offer hope through Jesus Christ to all who come through our doors. Sadly, we must acknowledge that absolutely nothing has changed in New York State with the overturn of Roe. In fact, now the state is working harder than ever to discredit Christian pregnancy resource centers like ours. They do a lot of different attacks to try to discredit Christian pregnancy centers. It's horrible. Additionally, several Christian pregnancy centers have been the target of hate crimes, vandalism, and defamation. But Christ warned us in the scriptures, the world hated him first, and they will hate us too, because we proclaim his truth. So what can the body of Christ do? What can the congregation of Bethel Baptist Church do? I advise you to seek God's direction. As a ministry that shares God's truth along with being a pregnancy center, it means that we are not funded by the state. And in fact, many grants that we would normally be um, able to get are, we are passed over for the fact that we share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if anyone has the ability or resources, see if God is leading you to support the ministry financially. Many of our supporters are monthly donors, but others make one-time gifts. Consider taking one of the baby bottles you're going to see that are in the back of the sanctuary. You can fill it up with coins, dollars, checks, whatever you want, and then bring it back. In the back of the church, there's also an Amazon wish list for office supplies at the ministry. There's also items that the center needs for its boutique that it has. Another way of helping is by being a volunteer. We need volunteers who can help at the center during the week. We need other volunteers that can help out for a special event. And we need still other volunteers that can serve in our fundraising committee. Additionally, if anyone is interested, we have an application that can be filled out if you're interested in joining the board and volunteering your time that way. As a board member myself, I share the skills God developed in me to help in ministry. I share my experience serving in the churches and other ministries and not-for-profits that I serve with. I also share my previous experience in marketing and graphic design. For example, in order to reach abortion-minded women, we have to do a lot of that battle online. When a young girl says, hey Siri, show me abortion centers near me, or show me abortion pills options. We would like to be the first call that she makes so that we have a chance that we can share with her the value of choosing life. And not just life for her baby, but that ultimately that she can come into a relationship with Christ and have eternal life. So CareNet, for the first time, has partnered up with a pro-life Christian marketing firm to reach these women. However, those laborers deserve their wages too. And CareNet is seeking anyone who is willing to partner with us in that battle. Whether it is by your resources, finances, whether it's your time, whether it's your knowledge, whatever it is, any help would be appreciated. But the thing that we ask first and foremost, the most powerful thing, prayer. We need a lot of prayer. There was a day that the liberal progressives had chosen as a day to attack anyone who was pro-life. And many people came to the community and we just had a time of prayer in front of the center. And many of you guys came too, so we appreciate that and ask you to please continue to pray, especially for those who are on the front lines. Scripture commands us to be the light, reflecting God's light to shine in the darkness of the world. But one of our clients was in the darkest of places, but came to see the true light. She said this, 
I attended a seminar titled Sexual Abuse in the Church. I knew I needed to be there, but it was painful and difficult. Many things hit too close to home. Staff members from CareNet were there and they brought printed material about their organization. During the break, one of the ladies mentioned a Bible study I could participate in at that center. I went and the study was a perfect framework for what God wanted for me. In the beginning, I was nervous, shy, bold, hopeful, and desperate. God's plan was something I never anticipated. Up to this point, I had worked hard to deal with my past. I tried to hide it, deny it, and protect myself from it. I attended groups and counseling and read Christian help books. Some helped, but I needed to dig deeper. The Bible course at Kirna was intense and personal, focusing totally on God. My old defense mechanisms, my survival modes, were no longer appropriate. Telling my story was hard, but I did it and completed the study. Thank you, God, for your love and desire to heal me, to remove major roadblocks. With the support of Karen, I am certain I will continue to move forward and become the woman God designed me to be. I am grateful for this ministry. It has truly changed my life. So on this Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, seek God's direction on how He is calling you to serve. We as the body of Christ must use whatever we have as good stewards and serve Him. Let me leave you with the words of a man of God I have a lot of love and respect for. R.C. Sproul. He said, If I know anything about the character of God after 50 years of ministry, I know that God hates abortion. May we all have the same attitude. May we all be used by God as his workmen to share with others the love that we should have for all those who are created in the image of God. May we share with others the love of life, especially the love and necessity of eternal life. And that is found in no other name than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To God be all the glory. Amen.